Hi folks, it's another ripping episode of Legends of Bevo where I chat to AFL legend premiership player Wayne Swass and also a legend of pranks as we find out today. I'm not kidding you, 14 dozen eggs would get thrown at the house in the wall, didn't matter. And he's also the Pucker Up founder uh, that's in terms of mental health. So we'll find out how he's overcome his own mental health battles and some tips for those that might be struggling out there. This plus much more on Legends with Bevo. G'day, I'm Wayne Swass, founder of Pucker Up. Played a little bit of local footy and uh, you're watching uh, Legends with Bevo. Welcome to Legends with Bevo. Thanks to Anytime Fitness Glenel. If you find anything spoken about in today's episode distressing, please contact Mental Health Emergency on 131465. Wayne Swatter great to have you on Legends with Bevo for a chat, mate. Um, how's everything going over there in Victoria and, and pucker up? Uh, thanks, Bev. I appreciate the invitation to join you. It's been an interesting year 2020 for a lot of people across our great country, but living in Melbourne, it's been the best way of describing the last six months is it's felt like we've been running a marathon with no finish line every week. And um, our uh, Premier made some announcements recently, which has just been a tremendous relief for a lot of people myself included, and uh, fingers crossed over the coming weeks we get a few more restrictions being lifted. It's quite surreal, Bevo, that <clears throat> this sound, this may sound funny to your listeners, but when you've been in lockdown for six months and you now drive around Melbourne and see other human beings sitting in cafes, in restaurants and pubs, you just sit there and go, is this really happening? Because th that's been our life for six months. So we, we've got a bit of our freedom and our liberties back. It's 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 a tremendous relief for a lot of people. And um, we're uh, we're going okay. Thank you. Oh, that's really good. And we'll get to Pucker Up in a moment and also um, the relationship that you've had between Pucker Up and eHarmony as part of Mental Health Week a couple of weeks ago. But um, we'll start with a bit of funny stuff. We saw on the weekend uh, your former coach, Dennis Pagan, winning with Johnny Get Ugly in the in the, in the the Victorian Derby, his very first ever Group 1. What a story that was. And um, perhaps tell us about the, the lighter side of Dennis Pagan. And we saw that emotional side to him on the weekend as well. Well, I think I saw the lighter side on the weekend because we didn't see, I, I, I've never seen him get emotional like that before. Um, I know Dennis in a, you know, obviously a different, a different environment and a different time where he was the coach of the Kangaroos. It is a great story. You know, he's a two-time premiership player. He's the Kangaroos greatest and most successful coach of all time. Um, he's a revered figure in AFL football. He's got a provisional um, a training license, which means that he can't train horses for other people. <clears throat> uh, so he's been training his own horse uh, for the past four or five months with his provisional license goes into the Amy Stakes. It's about 150, 160-year-old Group 1 um, uh, race, and he wins it. It's it's just a phenomenal story. He's 73 years of age. He, he obviously loves horse racing. He loves his horse. Um, and I, I must admit that when I was watching it, and I did watch it, my dad texts me later on. He goes, did you see Pago's horse one? I said, yeah. He goes, geez, he got emotional. I said, yeah, that's the bit I can't get my head around <laughs> because I'm used to this bloke losing his losing his cool, blowing his stack, <laughs> giving somebody a spray. Sometimes that was me. But I just think it was, you know, one of the one of the great, beautiful sporting moments of 2020. And um, he did all right out of footy, but $1.2 million went into his bank account and that's not taxed. <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind having a tenth of uh, a tenth of that. But anyway, well done to him, and it's a great story. <laughs> no, well said. You've answered it well. And uh, obviously, you had an illustrious career playing with the Sydney Swans and also the Roos. Uh, talk to us through some of your funny teammates over your time there, Swatter. Funny. Well, when when we played with Dennis, there wasn't a lot of fun because he was hard. Um, he was tough. He was uncompromising. I can remember a trip, it was 1995, and uh, this was at the time that Fitzroy were on their uh, knees. Uh, they weren't, weren't looking particularly financially strong. There was strong stories and rumours going around that Fitzroy was going to merge with North Melbourne. So Wayne Carey, the captain, I was the vice captain. I'd like to think that I was the second highest paid player there, but I have no idea. But anyway, the club decided <clears throat> we had a mid-season break, so they flew us up to Queensland, which was ironic for the Kangaroos because we had no money. And we used to train out of two portable classrooms from, from an old school somewhere. Oh, so they flew they flew us up there. And, and I remember being with Duck. We'd had a couple of sherbets. We were a little bit sideways. And we're sitting there the whole weekend. And we we're both rubbing our hands together. And we we're saying, oh, this is unbelievable. Once the, once the two clubs merge together, they're going to have to rip up our contracts. 
uh, we'll get bigger contracts, happy days. Well, about six weeks later, the AFL or the VFL at that time decided to send Br uh, Fitzroy up to Brisbane. So Duck and I stayed on the same contracts. In actual fact, I stayed on the same contract. I'm fairly, con I'm fairly confident Duck got a brand new contract, <laughs> which was the same thing. The same thing that happened every year with Duck was that he'd walk in, say, fellas, you need to take a haircut. That was always a sign Duck was renegotiating for a new contract. For Duck to get more money, we had to lose money. <laughs> That's rough, isn't it? Yeah. Well, no, it's what happens when you play with the greatest player of all time. <laughs> no, it certainly would have been a lot of fun, no doubt. Hey, um. We all love the the pranks in in footy clubs as well. Um, you know, I played footy for twenty plus years. Um, never at your level, obviously, just local footy. But um, mm. some of the pranks over your time, Wayne. What were some of them? Oh, the God. best ones you're sort of involved in or you come across? See, Bevo, this is where I need to be careful because I should have got the lawyers to verify whether or not I can go with some of these stories. Where do I start? <laughs> well, one of the ones that comes to mind. There's a few. We, when we first came to Melbourne, we were billeted out into clubhouses, and what that meant, <clears throat> pardon me, was. We would share a house that the club rented with other other players, and I remember uh, we were living in Mark, Market Street, Mooney Ponds, um, and there was a, another clubhouse in Flemington, and there was a, a player by the name of Russell Robinson, not the Russell Robinson, uh, but another another Russell Robinson, um, might have even been Ralph Robinson. That's how bad my memory is. But they lived in the clubhouse where the meals were prepared every night in Kensington. So Judy Francis, Jenny Burmeister. God bless them both. Wonderful, wonderful servants of the football club. They are, they are unofficial mums to so many North Melbourne players who came from the country. I need to say. <clears throat> so the ladies would prepare the meals in Kensington and then one of us who were living at the other clubhouses would drive past, pick the meals up and then take them home after training. So we remember, I remember picking up the meals one day. We went home to Margaret Street and we're sitting, we're sitting down about to tuck into a, a steak a dirty old steak with mushroom sauce. You'd have your peas, your carrots, and you'd have a big serving of mashed potato. <clears throat> and I remember going, <clears throat> cutting into the steak, and then what I used to like to do is just put a nice big lather of mashed potato on the steak, dip it into the mushroom sauce, and away you go. Well, I got the steak cut, and then I went to scoop up the, the, uh, um, the mashed potato, and I, I, I couldn't work out why my knife wouldn't scoop it up. Well, after about 30 seconds, I <clears throat> scraped off all the mashed potato, and here's a cricket bale which had been camouflaged underneath the mashed potato <laughs> by uh, Rowan Robinson. So what, what this led to was an all-out house war. And we, we, had a, we had a milk bar. Uh, we had a milk bar about 100 metres up the street. What we decided to do, and this went on for weeks, we would go into the milk bar, my housemates, so Robbie Walker, Stephen Clark, um, John McCarthy, and we would buy anywhere from 10 to 14 dozen eggs and then we would load up the car and then we would all go around to Kensington and someone would run to the doorbell and ring it and then the rest of us were all hiding in the garden and out the front of the house and the moment one of the boys opened up the door there'd just be this barrage of eggs. I'm not kidding you, 14 dozen eggs would get thrown at the house, in the wall, didn't matter. And this went on for weeks and it had stopped because one day they came around and broke into our house and put eggs through the entire interior of the house. Oh, no. Judy Francis was a loving, caring woman, but by God, she had a temper. And she came into our house one day and we hadn't cleaned it up and she ripped us a new asshole. went back, told Greg Miller and Ron Joseph, we all got set down and no more egg fights for the rest of my <laughs> AFL career. <laughs> that is a brilliant story. I love it. But, <laughs> then, but then what we did is we moved away from the eggs and Mark Brayshaw, who's the CEO of the Coaches Association, who has um, a couple of boys playing AFL footy and a former teammate of ours, um, he uh, lived with his beautiful wife and uh, his young family and uh, we thought it would be mildly amusing for about 10 weeks just to continue to water eight 10 pizzas and get them delivered off to Mark Brayshaw's house and charge his credit card for them. <laughs> oh, he wouldn't have been too happy about that. <laughs> no, especially when he found out it was Anthony Stevens that was making, uh, was doing all of this. And Anthony Stevens used to live with Sticks and his, uh, his beautiful family. And he was one of Sticks's favourite boys. <laughs> that's, that's the sort of behaviour we used to get up to, Bevo. We used to hide cars at training. Um, I, I am aware of some people putting dead fish in the hubcaps of cars, and I don't know if you've ever done it, but what happens, the smell works its way through the air conditioning ducts. Oh, no. And you can't get rid of it, and you don't know where it's coming from, but when you put it behind the hub of a wheel, 
can't find it. It's a beautiful thing. Oh, no. I'm I'm hoping that some of my mates aren't going to be watching this or listening to this because they might try and stitch me up And because I'm always the yeah. one that gets picked on, Swatter. So, well, that, um, that would suggest to me, Bevo, <laughs> that you're doing things to be picked on. <laughs> this is very true. <laughs> I, I tell you, I tell you another, I tell you another one that was really problematic was that um, we went through a phase at our footy club where you would have a shower, and then you'd go and put your underwear on, and then within about ninety seconds, you'd wonder why that private area was on fire. People would go and put deep heat on the inside of your underwear <laughs> while you're in the shower, and you had no idea. So that wasn't pleasant. <laughs> oh, gee whiz. Um, speaking of pranks and banter, uh, obviously um, we lost the great Spud Frawley only just last year and he was a, a close mate of Swatter. We'll get to that in a moment. But some of the banter that you boys have at Triple M, um, it just must be an absolute blast so being involved with some of those boys. I look, I, I feel very fortunate that I had such a long time in the media post-football career, but I, I had two stints at Triple M. Um, uh, interjected by some time with SEN. I loved all the stations and networks that I worked for, but I, I just, I have great memories and, and such um, such a wonderful time um, with all of the people that worked at Triple M. The, the beauty of Triple M for me was that we, we all have a passion for the game and we love the game in our own unique ways. But what made Triple M unique is that we were just allowed to bring our personalities to the broadcast and if you think about Spud, you know, I've, I've worked with Dennis Cometti, I've worked with uh, Clinton Gribus, who I regard as, as, you know, the for me, the best broadcaster, AFL broadcaster. I was lucky enough to do a little bit of work with Bruce McAvaney, um, Gary Lyon, um, you know, James Brayshaw, Luke Darcy, all of these wonderful broadcasters. And I, 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 Spud was a great mate and I've worked and known with Spud on and off radio for such a long period of time. And, and the beauty of Spud is he may not have been, <clears throat> he may not have been the best broadcaster and he could butcher the English language. But the beauty of Spud was that he was, in my opinion, the greatest entertainer. He was a man that could bring the energy and the fun and the levity and the laughter to a broadcast. He was self-effacing, which meant that he wasn't afraid of having fun with himself. And one of my fondest memories of Spud, and there were so many, was that we, we, we would work on radio and, and, and you could just see that he had something he wanted to share with you and you're never quite sure where it was going to go. go. And if you're the host... That's a bit of a nightmare because you're not sure if you're going to have to rein him in or try and shut him up. The problem with Spud is if you gave him half a chortle, so a little, <clears throat> that was enough. And then all of a sudden, if he thought that you were starting to laugh, that was the gates would open and he would just go 100 miles an hour. And before you knew it, there's 10 minutes of radio. You're not sure what's just happened. You're crying with laughter. He's rolling around having fun. And I just I, I just think that he's... Uh, He's, he's a big loss to radio. He's a big loss in life, but his ability to entertain people is second to none. And he was just a magnificent broadcaster and a magnificent person. Yeah, well said. I remember the Saturday rub, or still is one of my favourite things on to listen to during the footy season and, and the bounce as well. It's just, it's not the same without the great man on there, Swatter. No, we, we, we miss him dearly. Um, we do miss him dearly. Like a lot of people, I think about him often. It's, you know, it's still hard to come to terms with um, that, that he's he's gone. But, uh, you know, the, what a life. Um, and and I'd like to think, I don't know, I don't know the answer to this, Bevo, but I'd, love, I'd really love to think that he understands somehow how universally admired and, and loved he was. It takes a special person to be universally admired and loved. And I think Spud is a through and, through, and through St Kilda man but it's the work that he did post-football that I think endeared himself to so many people. And, you know, you look at the turnout at the funeral, it was broadcast by Fox Footy Live. Um, and the thing that, I, the thing that I've heard, I heard um, for a couple of months, you know, obviously at the time, but for a couple of months afterwards, was that so many people said, I've never met him, but I felt like I knew him. And I think that's testament to the impact that he had on so many people. Yeah, again, well said. Um, certainly was a very interesting um, character, that's for sure. Uh, now, 
We should get to the topic of mental health because um, fortunately you've overcome mental health. You mentioned Spud who unfortunately um, we lost because of the mental health battle that he sort of went through. But, you know, you've come over, come through the other side and gone through a hell of a time. Credit to you uh, for that, Swatter, and now you've started up Pucker Up. Tell us more about Pucker Up, though, what it's all about for those people out there that don't know about it. So it's a, it's a social enterprise, uh, Bevo, which we established in March of 2017. I'd spent the previous five years working in corporate Australia in a telecommunications role. And I've, I've always had this desire to want to help other people. Um, all, all, all I've, I just have a lived experience with these type of conditions. It doesn't make me any better or any worse. It's just my journey. Um, I manage my well-being on a, on a daily basis. Uh, I'll be on this journey for the rest of my life and I'm, I'm okay with that. I've actually made peace with that. But what I realised when I was working in the telco industry that I was getting well paid, um, I could sell any form of technology to a business which allowed them to do things more effectively and efficiently. But every time I walked out of the business that I, I sold something to, there was a transaction of goods and there was an exchange of money. <clears throat> but more importantly, there was no positive impact on a single life within that business. And I'm a purpose-driven person. It's really important to me that whatever work I do, there's purpose to it, there's meaning to it, and there's the potential of impact associated with it. So fortunately for me, I have an incredible mentor, a man that I've known for 15 years. Um, we had successfully established a charity in 2006, and we ran that until 2010. We closed that down. We've stayed friends, and he's been a mentor uh, since 2006. And around about 2016, I'd really made a conscious decision to ramp up my advocacy via social media. And, and my mentor had been watching this and in early 2017. He came to me with a proposition and his simple question was, do you think you could have a bigger impact if you were full-time back into the wellbeing space? And I said, yeah, I, I do. I do believe that. So fortunately for me, that led to a decision where his um, private equity company invested some seeding capital that allowed me to bring Pucker up to life. We're coming up towards four years. Um, and we're, we're, we, our vision, Bevo, is to eliminate suicide. Now, for a lot of people, that, that might be an unachievable goal and that might be really aspirational. But we believe that that's possible. And the reality of this optimistic aspirational goal is if we don't set the goal we'll never achieve it anyway so what we are, what we are committed to doing is our vision is to end suicide completely but the way we're doing it is different to the way that we approach suicide prevention historically in Australia and this is important it's a long-winded answer but I think it's important to give people an understanding of what we do and why we do it our goal is to end suicide but the way that we achieve that is by getting upstream, which means not staying in the space of crisis. The way that we approach suicide prevention in Australia, and this is not critical, is there's two things that happen consistently. People wait until they get really sick before they start to think about getting help. And the way the system and the services are set up, they're set up in the crisis space. So someone needs to present in crisis before they start to get admitted into these services. We've done this historically in Australia for decades. The problem with that is that we've got more people in crisis, a system which is overwhelmed, under-resourced and fundamentally flawed, which means when you overlay the impact of COVID, we've got a system that can't respond to the increasing number of people who are now in crisis because that was already happening pre-COVID. So our, our positioning is that we don't, want to, we don't want to work in that space. Those services need to continue to do their job in that pointy end of, of mental health conditions and crisis, but we want to move completely up the other end and our, our objective and our mission is to develop education programs that empower people and teach them what does wellbeing look like, what does it mean to me, and what are the tools and strategies that we can teach people to develop so they can stay healthy. And what I mean by that is one in five people in any 12-month period in Australia will live with a significant mental health condition, and predominantly that's anxiety or depression. 20% of the Australian population, which is 5 million people, will be living with these conditions today, and some of these people will be your audience. 
We need to support these people. But we actually think well, the focus needs to shift from just the one in five to what are we doing to help the four in five people stay healthy and prevent people from developing mental health conditions? So our, our mission is to educate people so they can begin to look after their mental health in exactly the same way or similar ways than they, that they do with their physical health. 99% of the population understand the importance and need to look after physical health. Less than 20%, and I've worked in this space for nearly 16 years, conservatively, less than 20% of people have made the same connection that physical health is important, so is their mental health. Our job is to help everyone make that connection and then give them the tools that allow people to look after their well-being because everyone, 100% of the population, has well-being. So what can we do to help people look after it? That's what we do. Absolutely well said, mate. Um, yeah, give you a round of applause for that one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, recently you um, teamed up as part of National Mental Health Week with eHarmony. We see all the adverts on eHarmony about, you know, people looking for relationships and this sort of thing. Um, it's quite an interesting, uh, I guess, uh, partnership though, Swatter. Tell us more about this. Yeah, look, it's, 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 um, eHarmony is, is obviously a, a dating platform. Um, but importantly, what eHarmony have done recently was they commissioned some research. And this, the, the research was focusing on the male demographics um, within um, the community that uses eHarmony because what eHarmony and Pucker Up have acknowledged and recognised, and this is one of the reasons why we partnered together, <clears throat> was because that we live in a world that perhaps doesn't encourage men to be able to step forward um, and begin to communicate about challenges or issues, emotions, fears, insecurities um, that they might be experiencing. And some of the research um, that uh, eHarmony commissioned found that you know, around 60% of um, men understand that they are supported and encouraged, friends, family and the community, to talk about uh, mental health issues, but they still choose not to. Um, uh, 30%, and, and this is probably the most concerning statistic for me, was that th just over 30% of men surveyed with the eHarmony uh, research um, indicated that it would have to get significantly worse. So a mental health issue or a, or a challenge would have to get significantly worse before they actually thought about talking about what they were going through. 50, just over 50% of, of men surveyed also felt that they needed to hide their mental health issues from their partners. The whole purpose of this campaign, which is called Guy Talk, is to really encourage all men of all ages to begin to talk more openly and honestly. And having worked in this space, Bevo, for a really long period of time, I was one of these men. You know, I hid my conditions from my uh, wife, from my parents, from my family, from my teammates, every, not my wife, I should say, my wife, two doctors and a psychologist were the only four people that knew. Everybody else that I knew, um, I didn't tell anyone for 12 years. So the reason why I didn't tell people for 12 years what I was going through was because of fear. Fear of people judging me, fear of people seeing me as weak, fear of people losing respect. I didn't want to lose my career, I didn't want to lose relationships, and I certainly didn't want to lose opportunities. But the other really important reason why I didn't talk was because I didn't have the communicational tools to talk, nor did I have the confidence. And what I mean by that, Bevo, is this. I could talk to anyone about my career. I could talk to anyone about sport, work. I could talk to anybody about um, how do I get fitter, how do I get stronger. I, as a male, did not know how to communicate or interpret what am I feeling, what am I thinking, and how do I how do I talk about those things? And this is a challenge for a lot of men. And this is why this campaign and our partnership with eHarmony is really important. We need to give opportunities to all males, from young to middle to old, the opportunities in the environments to connect emotionally. Because if we don't have the conversational tools and the ability to notice how are we feeling, what are we thinking? Is it causing us stress? And who can I talk to? Then the risk we run is people will do what I did. I didn't talk because I didn't know how to talk about emotions and feelings. The reason I can talk about emotions and feelings now is because I've developed the conversational tools. I've stopped living my life worried about what people think at the age of 52. I live my life based on my expectations and what is important to me. 
And again, this is why this campaign is really important because if we don't change the narrative and the way that we condition men of all ages, then we're going to have an increasing problem with men who are really struggling and not able to cope. And I think we have this wonderful opportunity of educating young boys so that they stay emotionally connected and expressive as they grow up. Because if we can do that, we can change future generations and that leads to healthier communities in a country. And 996, um, you had a situation there, Swatter, where you just won a premiership and um, you've actually come out openly and said that you were smiling and, and happy on the outside, but on the inside, you were just hurting so much when you've just, you know, won the, the biggest achievements of your whole career winning a premiership in the AFL. Not many people can say they've done that, but you're actually inside really hurting. Um, tell us more about that. Yeah, that was three and a half years, three years, you know, over three years into a private battle with, started out with depression. Uh, it also then culminated in challenges with anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder. So I was drinking heavily. I was using drugs as a way of coping. I wasn't I wasn't prioritizing my mental health and I was emotionally tired um, and I was I was drained. I mean, when you live with these conditions, Bevo, I mean, yeah, I was playing AFL footy and that's demanding. And that's demanding when everything's going well and you're fit and you're healthy and you've got everything under control. But when you when you introduce mental health conditions to that type of job, you have no energy left. And I was able to compete. Um, I did, I've never, I'm really proud of the fact that I never missed a single training session or a game of football because of my conditions. But the truth of the matter was that I was emotionally bankrupt. I had no remaining energy. Every day I woke up since the 9th of August, 1993, on the day that I was diagnosed with depression until that beautiful day in September of 1996 when I became a premiership player with the Kangaroos. Every day I had hid the fact that I had mental health conditions from everybody bar two people, my doctor and my wife. Not a teammate, not a coach, not a family member, not a supporter or a sponsor knew. So I'm blessed that I am able to say that I'm a premiership player and that is such a special moment in my sporting career and life. But at the same time, I, 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 I was tired. I felt and was thinking that the only option I had available left to me to end what I was experiencing at a personal level was to hurt myself. And that was the thought, they, they were the thoughts of a desperate man who was really tired and in a lot of discomfort, who hadn't accepted he was unwell, who was self-medicating and who was doing things that were cannibalising his health. And um, I, I think it's really important I think it's really important to me for others that I use the platform that I have to educate people about the impact of these conditions because on the surface, 99.9% .9 of the population would have rightfully thought, premiership player, how good, must be so happy. In one respect, I was. But I used that as a jarring opportunity to challenge people that this is what suicide and suicidal ideation, which means thoughts of suicide, can look like. You can be a premiership player on the biggest stage in your sport nationally across the country and be still thinking about hurting yourself. And that's the reason why I shared the image. Yeah. So what a well, well done to you. Um, obviously, on your amazing AFL career, but most importantly, that you've been able to overcome these mental health battles. And now, like you said, speak about it openly because it would have been so tough to, you know, on the outside be celebrating a premiership, but on the inside be going through such a tough time. So credit to you, mate. Um, hopefully, we've uh, you've we've you know changed some people's lives today by talking about this. And and most importantly, if you are going through tough times, there is people out there to help. And I'll certainly be uh, sharing this with all the mental health people out there, mate. And once again, thanks for giving me your time. Well done everything with Pucker Up and, and the partnership with eHarmony. Thanks to Karen from Soda Communications as well for teeing up this chat. No, I appreciate it, Bevo. If I can just finish by saying, you know, we have talked about suicide. If people who are feeling uncomfortable or this has been tri triggering, want to steer them to Lifeline, 13, 11, 14. And then also importantly, Bevo, if people want to learn about strategies and tools that they can develop, jump on the Pucker Up podcast every episode in partnership with AIA Vitality. There's a potential strategy or tool that people can develop, which then allows them to look after their wellbeing. Really appreciate the chat, mate. Thanks for the time. No, thank you so much, mate. Really enjoyed it. Yeah! 
sounds so good. Sounds, 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 sounds.